astrophysicist and he's going to teach us quite a lot today. <laughs> so I have my own mic here, so. Okay, I'm going to uh, begin by talking about gravitational waves from a somewhat different point of view than uh, Thibaut de Moore did. Uh, and uh, I'll talk about theory for maybe a third or half of the time, and then I'll talk about experiment, because this is a very special time in experimental searches for gravitational waves. We are within a few years of finding the waves, we think, in three different frequency bands, as I'll describe, with a fourth frequency band coming along maybe a decade later. Uh, so uh, a different viewpoint, gee, I changed that to be different viewpoint rather than new. It's, I think it's not particularly new on gravitational waves and their generation in terms of the Riemann curvature tensor. Uh, and so I call this the tidal field and frame drag field because those are, once you've chosen a reference frame, as I'll describe, these are the in, uh, irreducible tensorial parts of the Riemann tensor. Uh, so if we divide space-time into space plus time by picking a family of space-like hypersurfaces, as is always done when, uh, almost always done when one does numerical relativity, numerical relativity now being a very mature field in which we are learning a lot about dynamics of space-time. So if we do uh, set up a foliation of uh, space-time into space plus time in this way, then as you know, the electromagnetic field tensor, which lives in four-dimensional space-time, splits up into the electric field and the magnetic field, which live in the hypersurfaces that we have chosen. And we visualize the magnetic field by field lines like those around the Earth, the electric field by electric field lines like those between a positive and a negative charge, and those are standard tools for uh, understanding visually and heuristically what goes on with the electromagnetic field. Similarly, if we foliate space-time in this manner, the Riemann curvature tensor, after we've chosen these slices, splits up into two irreducible tensorial parts, which are both symmetric trace-free tensors that live in the space slices. This E, J, K is the analog of the electric field, B, J, K is the analog of the magnetic field. E, J, K is sometimes called the electric part of the Riemann tensor. I prefer to call it the tidal field because it's the thing that produces tides on the Earth's oceans, for example. And BJK, I like to call the frame drag field because it's associated with the dragging of inertial frames. More spe precisely, if you introduce then an orthonormal basis uh, with the time direction going orthogonal to this slice, and uh, then the space-time, space-time part of the Riemann tensor is the tidal field. And you recognize in the equation of geodesic deviation, that's the thing that, that pushes things together and apart. So more precisely, if I have two freely falling particles, uh, one at a location Q in space-time, another at location P, uh, and they're separated by a spatial separation C uh, that's a vector lying in this surface, then the acceleration of this particle relative to that particle, delta A, is just minus the contraction of the uh, tidal field into the separation vector. That's just one uh, standard way, one way of writing down geodesic deviation. Less familiar is the frame drag field. It, that is obtained by taking a dual of the Riemann tensor from one side using the levi civita tensor to convert two spatial indices into one time index. And then looking at, the, again, the space-time, space-time part of the Riemann tensor. And th that gives you a uh, measure of the differential frame dragging in the sense that if you have two gyroscopes, one at Q and one at P, and you use the inertial frames associated with this gyroscope, and you watch the precession of that gyroscope due to dragging of inertial frames, due to the Riemann curvature tensor, the angular velocity of this gyroscope relative to the gyroscope at Q is just the contraction of the separation vector into that frame drag field. 
So those are the two parts of the Riemann curvature tensor, and they're going to play a major role in my discussion of gravitational waves. Uh, we visualize these by the analog of electric field lines and magnetic field lines. Uh, what we do is we look at the eigenvector fields of BJK and of EJK, and we construct the integral curves of the eigenvector fields. And so because these are three by three uh, tensors, uh, they, there are three eigenvector fields. Uh, and so there are three sets of field lines orthogonal to each other. And I'll explain this particular uh, family of field lines. But you wind up with three sets of field lines for the tidal field and three sets of field lines for the uh, frame drag field. It's a network of field lines. But I have found these field lines to be very powerful ways to understand visually what's going on, for example, in numerical relativity simulations. So let me build up to these frame drag and tidal field lines a little bit slowly. I'm going to begin with frame dragging. Suppose that I have a black hole, a curved black hole, it's spinning around this axis. I put a person up near the north pole of that black hole. And this person, this woman, looks down at her feet and examines the uh, precession of a gyroscope at her feet with respect to one at her head. And she sees the gyroscope at her feet going around counterclockwise relative to the one at her head because of the frame drag field. If n is the unit vector along her body, then if you think about it for a moment, you'll recognize then that the uh, angular velocity of her feet relative to her head, if I divide it by her height, this is going to be the normal, normal component of the frame drag field. And so I color the horizon by the strength of the normal, normal component of the frame drag field which is just has this physical meaning of this differential frame dragging that she experienced. The North Pole, northern hemisphere of the black hole, it's red. Uh, her feet are dragged, her uh, gyroscope at her feet is dragged uh, counterclockwise relative to the one at her head. By the way, if her feet look at her head, her feet see her head dragged counterclockwise. It's the same way as if you take a towel, a wet towel, and you wring it out to get the water out of it. If your left hand sees your right hand going counterclockwise, then your right hand will see your left hand going counterclockwise. So it's a, a property of the field here, a counterclockwise twist in frame dragging. In the South Polar region, it's a clockwise twist in frame dragging. Um, then I would like to call a region with large amount, uh, uh, oh, well, let me say, we call this quantity the horizon vorticity, taking a name from fluid mechanics, of course. But we're not talking about fluids at all. We're talking about differential uh, vorticity, differential frame dragging. And so a region with large counterclockwise vorticity we call a vortex, a frame drag vortex, if you wish. One with large clockwise vorticity is a clockwise vortex on the horizon of the black hole. Um, we're looking at the longitudinal part of the frame drag field, and that turns out to be boost invariant. So it doesn't matter how, whether she is hovering above the black hole or falling in, this is simply a property of the horizon that is experienced in the same magnitude of strength by anybody who is hovering or falling in to a black hole. Now, Let's go outside the black hole and talk about the vortex lines and their vorticities. So, as I said, for the frame drag field, an integral curve of an eigenvector field of the frame drag field is called a vortex line. And its eigenvalue, BNN, if N is the uh, eigenvector field, is the vorticity of that vortex line. So here is a family of vortex lines around a curved black hole. Um, there is a vortex line that comes out of the south polar region, goes around and uh, or all the way around the black hole and comes back in at the south polar region, this blue vortex line. That is a clockwise vortex line 
you put a person along that vortex line and she is twisted, or the differential frame dragging is a clockwise differential frame dragging. And similarly, the red vortex lines have a clockwise uh, vorticity uh, associated with, clock with clockwise twist in the frame dragging or differential frame dragging. Um, so I think I've, I've said all, all of this that's on here now. And so you, oh, and, and then I want to emphasize through every point in space here, there are three field lines, three vortex lines. Uh, if you take some point up here, uh, there is this red vortex line that is coming out of this north polar vortex. There is a blue one that came out of the south polar vortex and goes through that point. So that's two, and they're orthogonal to each other because eigenvector fields are orthogonal to each other. For, and uh, uh, the uh, third one is an azimuthal. Uh, frame drag field that winds its way up from the polar regions. So those are the three frame drag fields for a, a rotating black hole. A region that has a very large value of this vorticity for one of the frame drag fields, I like to call a vortex or a frame drag vortex. So there are two frame drag vortexes coming out of a curved black hole. One, a counterclockwise vortex coming out of the north polar regions, and a clockwise vortex coming out of the south polar regions. So now we can get interesting. I'd like to collide two black holes. And I'm going to show you the re results of numerical relativity simulations. This black hole has a counterclockwise vortex coming out on the upper side and the clockwise vortex on the lower side. Uh, that has the clockwise on the upper side and the counterclockwise on the lower side. For simplicity, they're going to collide head on. We'll watch the beginning of the collision here and see what happens at the beginning. So they collide, they merge. This is the event horizon of the merged black hole in, in this numerical relativity simulation. It's by the Caltech Cornell CETA uh, Newmark Relativity Group. You see there are now four vortexes sticking out of that merge horizon quite naturally. These two vortexes, blue up here and red down below that you can't see because it's hidden, came from the right-hand black hole. And this red here and blue down below came from the left-hand black hole. These vortexes turn out to robustly retain their individuality. But they're going to interact. And we're going to watch what happens due to their interaction with each other. So this is, to me, rather exciting because Johnny Wheeler, when I was his graduate student back long before most of you were born, very long before most of you were born, he told me that we should be learning by numerical relativity about the nonlinear dynamics of curved space time. Well, here it is. We're going to see the nonlinear dynamics of curved space time and how these vortexes, these frame drag vortexes, interact. Okay. So here is a simulation again. I'm not going to show the vortex lines for the moment. I'm just going to show the horizon vorticity. Okay. Remember, this side is blue. That side is red. So you blue here. Now it's red. Now it's blue. Now it's red. So what's happening? These vortexes, when they interact with each other, they exchange vorticity. A vortex that was a counterclockwise vortex in terms of its twisting of space interacts with a clockwise vortex and they exchange vorticity. They basically grab each other and twist each other around and, and exchange vorticity. At the moments when this is completely green, I just show the movie over and over again, when it's completely green, there are no vortex lines sticking through the black hole at all. They popped off the black hole and then they get recreated as the vortexes interact and exchange vorticity. And so something happens to these vortex lines when they pop off the black hole. 
So here is a picture of the vortex lines at a moment when you have maximum vorticity. Uh, they have not popped off. Uh, the counterclockwise vortex lines come out of this counterclockwise vortex. They go around and go back into a counterclockwise vortex that's on the back side here. The clockwise vortex lines similarly, so they are anchored in the black hole. But when they, uh, in the oscillation, the horizon goes green, they have, de they have detached from the horizon. And clearly what they must do is they must join on to themselves to make a loop, a closed loop. So that is what happens. And this is a picture of the set of closed loops very much like smoke rings that have been emitted in these oscillations over the last few oscillations. So uh, these are going to uh, reconnect on, connect onto each other and go flying out as a loop. This is a loop that was created previously like a smoke ring. And here's another loop created previously like a smoke ring. And these are moving outward now once they get into the wave zone, which begins about here. They're moving outward at the speed of light. And as they move through the Bianchi identities, which in a 3 plus 1 split like this look very, very much like the Maxwell equations, through the Bianchi identities, these uh, frame drag fields, that is what we are looking at, generate tendex fields, that is field lines associated with the electric part of the Riemann tensor, associated with a tidal field. And so once you get out here, nested together with these uh, frame drag vortex lines, there are squeezing tendex lines that go around the black hole like this. I show them in green uh, that squeeze a person who is here. They're associated with the uh, e, J, K, the tidal part of the Riemann tensor. They're the eigenvector uh, fields of the, uh, or the integral curves of the eigenvector fields uh, of the tidal part of the Riemann tensor. Squeezing going around like that, stretching going around like this. And this whole pattern goes traveling outward at the speed of light. And if you look at what the pattern looks like locally, for the tendex lines, locally, they're just orthogonal tendex lines stretching along one direction and squeezing along the orthogonal direction, transverse to the direction of motion. Vortex lines twisting in differential frame dragging uh, at 45 degree angles to the tendex lines. And that's a gravitational wave. So that's how you can visualize the production of gravitational waves. Yeah. Does this oscillation continue indefinitely? No, if you watch the oscillations, if you were to watch them, they die out because the waves are carrying away energy. And then they suddenly regenerate because I loop, start the movie over again. <laughs> <laughs> so so they, they decay. Okay. What percentage of the mass is ejected? So it, for uh, spinning black holes that collide and merge, up to about 10% as gravitational waves. I'll return to that in a little bit. Okay. Non-spinning black holes, it's less, I've forgotten, it's like 2% or 3%. Um. So in the wave zone, the electric and magnetic lines are not the No, they are. So these are the vortex lines. Oh, they're, no, they're, no, they're twisted by 45 degrees. And this is related to the spin of the graviton, which I will return to in a few minutes. Okay. It's related to the fact that the spin of the graviton is two rather than one. So all angles are, are cut down by a factor of two from what you're accustomed to electromagnetically. Are these two pinnacles enough to characterize the Riemann tensor? This is the entire Riemann tensor. Of course, first you had to choose a reference frame for a space, space like foliation. Having done that, the re information about the Riemann tensor is tied up in these two sets of uh, field lines plus the choice of foliation. You need to know what, what surfaces you're doing this in. Yeah. 
And so for me, this is really a powerful way to think about what goes on in space-time curvature. It's very much like what you do in electromagnetic theory. Right. Uh, yeah, so uh, let me do two black two two uh, uh, orbiting black holes. Um, so or an orbiting collision. Okay, um, but this could equally well just be two uh, a, a, a binary star system with uh, two uh, uh, orbiting uh, stars orbiting around each other. Again, I'm showing you the vortex lines because these are spinning orbiting black holes. What happens, not surprisingly in this case, is that as the black holes go around each other and then merge, the vortex lines swing back like water from a turning sprinkler. And so you have the red ones and the blue ones uh, creating this kind of a, a whirling, whirlpool pattern. And as they get out into the wave zone, they generate, once again, a pattern of tendex lines orthogonal uh, at 45 degrees to themselves. And that then becomes a gravitational wave. It's the same story. Now, if these are non-spinning black holes, um, you can do, have the same kind of a discussion. But the important thing then is the tendex lines associated with the uh, tidal gravitational fields of the, of the binary system. So the binary system has tendex lines that stick out that form basically a dipolar uh, form going out and around uh, uh, between these two black holes. And as they, as they orbit each other, those tendex lines uh, splay out in a similar kind of a manner and they generate vortex lines as they travel outward and make gravitational waves. So in, just in a simple Newtonian situation, you can do a similar discussion and get similar results, but it's the, the primary thing that's attached to the source in that case is tendex lines rather than vortex lines. But I just found it nicer to begin with vortex lines. There's a duality uh, in the Riemann tensor between, in vacuum between tendex lines and vortex lines between the electric and magnetic f or the tidal fields and the frame drag fields. So everything I've just told you in terms of gravitational waves created by uh, vortex lines that are attached to a source, it goes over, it, you get the same kind of process with tendex lines that are, that are attached to a source. Um, this is the actual pattern then in that case uh, of two merging black, black holes. Uh, the, this is the pattern in the equatorial plane that you get of uh, the vortex lines coming out like this, uh, the red ones and the blue ones coming out from the side, red ones from here, blue ones from there, and making an orthogonal pattern that becomes gravitational waves. So th this is ac actually at very late stages and it's uh, just from perturbation theory uh, of a Schwarzschild black hole. So now let me talk about the gravitational wave field once you get out in the wave zone. Um, the tidal field, as I remarked before, is the space-time, space-time part of the Riemann tensor. Geodesic deviation, the relative acceleration of two particles, which is the second time derivative of uh, the position of the second time derivative of the separation of the particles is minus uh, the tidal field times the separation. Uh, you integrate this up, and I may as well have called call this delta C instead of uh, delta X, I should have done, in order to, the, the integral is obvious. But, uh, but when you integrate this up after two time integrals, uh, you, uh, if you define um, EXX uh, in a Cartesian coordinate system with X along the uh, stretching tendex lines and y along the squeezing tendex lines. If you define EXX to be minus H plus two time derivatives, EYY to be plus H plus two time derivatives, then you find by simple mathematics that the fractional stretching for the person whose body is oriented along the red tendex line is just H plus. That's the gravitational field. This is associated with the plus polarization. 
and the fractional squeezing del C over C, this being the height, uh, is minus. That should be H cross uh, rather than H plus. Or wait, no, I'm sorry, that is H plus. This is the, the plus polarization. So it stretch along one axis and the squeeze along the other. This is just to introduce H plus and H cross. Did you talk about H plus and H cross? So th this is the way that uh, the experimenters like to think about it, just in terms of these two amplitudes for a gravitational wave field. And they're the second time uh, integrals of the Riemann tensor, basically. You differentiate them twice and you get the relevant components of the Riemann tensor, or the, ti the tidal part of the Riemann tensor. So, and for the cross polarization, you have the stretching and squeezing at 45 degree lines, and uh, it's H cross that does, uh, that produces that. So that the fractional stretching is H cross and minus H cross for the fractional squeezing. So this H plus and H cross is the way an experimenter likes to talk about a gravitational wave. So a few remarks about the order of magnitude of strengths of gravitational waves. If I take the, say, the trace reversed uh, uh, metric perturbation that I presumed you worked in terms of, and I split it up uh, uh, in term, into multiple moments around the source in a slow motion situation so a multipolar expansion makes sense, then just on the basis of uh, dimensional considerations and the fact that you know that the field has to die out as 1 over r as you go away from the source, you'll have mass divided by r, you'll have a mass dipole moment divided by r, you've got to take one time derivative in order to get this dimensionally correct. Throw in the right numbers of factors of g and c. The quadrupole moment, second time derivative divided by r, throw in the num required numbers of factors of g and c. Just knowing that it dies out as 1 over r, and that you can expand in multiple moments, that's all you need to get this form. Uh, having gotten that form, just uh, in uh, terms of the general structure, you recognize that the mass can't oscillate, so that doesn't produce any waves. The mass dipole moment, this, this first time derivative is the momentum, which is conserved at linear order, and we're working at linear order at this point. So that doesn't oscillate. The first thing that can oscillate is the mass quadrupole moment in a slow motion situation. We have the second time derivative of the mass quadrupole moment. That's basically an order of magnitude. It's the mass times the square of the size of the source divided by the period of oscillation squared. Or it's basically the internal kinetic energy, but really if you look at it more closely, it's the internal kinetic energy associated with non-spherical motions and non-dipolar motions, that associated with quadrupolar motions really. And so in order of magnitude, H plus and H cross have to be the relevant factors of G and C times the kinetic energy of quadrupolar, of, of, and kinetic energy of internal motion with quadrupolar shapes divided by R. Or you take this internal kinetic energy, turn it into a, a mass by dividing by C squared, multiply by G, and compute the Newtonian potential. And that tells you that the magnitude of H plus and H cross is basically that of the Newtonian gravitational potential of the internal kinetic energy associated with quadrupolar motions. So you put in numbers then for this, put the source at a distance of 100 megaparsecs from Earth, 300 million light years, sort of the, cl the closest that we would expect we would have any chance to catch uh, a binary neutron star or binary black hole merger. Uh, put in a quadrupolar kinetic energy of the rest mass of the sun times c squared. That's an optimistic amount of internal kinetic ener energy for a binary made of a few solar masses. You get 10 to the minus 21. That tells us if we want to have any hope at all of seeing gravitational waves, we have to be able to detect strains 
or gravitational wave field, the strains delta length over length at the 10 to the minus 21 level. And more likely you need 10 to the minus 22, maybe even 10 to the minus 23. We're awfully ignorant. A word, a few words about gravitons. <laughs> um, I thought I had a different version of this slide. Let me go, no, no, okay. So let me do it this way. So the, in, in general, in physics, the spin and the rest mass of some quantum particle leave their imprint on the classical fields associated with the particle. That's true of neutrino fields, uh, that's true of, uh, uh, of boson fields, and so forth. Uh, here we have, in the case of an electromagnetic wave, uh, you have uh, the property that if you take the instantaneous electric field associated with a wave that's going into the board, and you rotate it, you have to rotate by 360 degrees to bring that electric field back to the direction it was originally pointing in. Uh, that, if you take that 360 degrees and you divide it by the, this return, take 360 degrees, divide by the return angle, how far you have to rotate, you get one, and that is the spin of the photon. This is a very simple-minded way to talk about the irreducible re representation of the little group, the, of the Lorentz group, uh, uh, which is the, the foundation for spin in uh, field theory. But it's just the very simple idea that the return angle of the classical field, when you rotate around the propagation direction of the classical field, if you divide that into 360 degrees, you get the spin of the associated quantum mechanical particle. And it is rooted then in the standard group theory arguments from field theory. For the graviton, here I uh, describe the graviton in terms of a ring of test particles that have been stretched and squeezed, but I could describe it equally well in terms of the tendex fields. Uh, you take a tendex line, you rotate through 180 degrees, and you get back to the original pattern. And so the spin of the graviton is 360 degrees divided by 180 degrees, or it's two. So that way we infer that the spin of the graviton is two, and the fact that the propagation speed in classical general relativity of the gravitational wave is the speed of light tells us, of course, that the graviton then must have zero rest mass. Also important is the mean occupation number of the uh, single particle modes of the graviton field. And so if we have, for example, a, a source of gravitational waves, a supernova explosion, or uh, two neutron stars merging, uh, and uh, you come get off something of order, one solar rest mass of energy, it may be a tenth, it may be a hundredth. I'm not concerned about factors of a hundred or a thousand or a million, as you see. Uh, and I divide that by the energy of one quantum, you get 10 to the 78 is the number of gravitons that are emitted in a burst of gravitational waves that carries one solar mass of energy. Uh, those go into something like 10,000 modes of the graviton field, if you think it through, for the kind of source I'm talking about. So the mean occupation number is something like 10 to the 74, and that's kind of classical. It's big compared to one. So we don't worry about quantum effects in, in astrophysical discussions of gravitational waves. It's a, the gravitational waves are very highly classical. So now let me back off and uh, abandon the theoretical physicist's point of view and talk about uh, electromagnetic waves and gravitational waves from an astronomer's point of view. So electromagnetic waves are oscillations of the electromagnetic field that propagate through space-time. Gravitational waves are oscillations of the fabric of space-time itself, if you take the uh, geometry of space-time point of view that I like to take, rather than the field theory point of view. Electromagnetic waves are generally, almost always, incoherent superpositions of waves from particles, atoms, and molecules. There are exceptions 
there are uh, maser sources, astrophysical maser sources, but almost always it's incoherent superpositions from particles, atoms, and molecules. Gravitational waves in the astrophysical context are emitted coherently by the bulk motion of matter or of tendex and vortex lines, but bulk motion of something. So it's a very coherent emission versus incoherent. Electromagnetic waves are all too easily absorbed and scattered, coming from their source to the observer. Gravitational waves are never significantly absorbed or scattered, even near the Planck era. The implications, many gravitational wave sources won't be seen electromagnetically, and so there are likely to be a lot of surprises in gravitational wave astronomy. Because the two kinds of, uh, of sources are so extremely different. Um, in electromagnetic astronomy, you usually, you usually observe time evolving spectrum. That is, you rarely are looking at amplitude and phase in, in phase coherent ways. Sometimes you are, but usually you look at the, uh, at the intensity of the radiation and the spectrum of the radiation and watch that evolve in time. Gravitational waves, you uh, will usually observe waveforms. H plus is a function of time at your location, and H cross is a function of time in the time domain. And so you're looking at amplitude and phase gravitationally. Electromagnetic waves, most detectors are very large compared to a wavelength of the waves. Not all, but most. That means that you have a very narrow field of view. You get very good angular resolution on sources. Gravitationally, most detectors are small compared to a wavelength. And so you basically have very poor angular resolution. You can see the entire sky all at once. It's a very different kind of a business. You have poor angular resolution. You have to get your angular re resolution through time delay in the arrival time of certain features in the waveforms. Electromagnetic waves, more source, most sources vary are very large compared to the wavelength, and that means you can make pictures of the source. Gravitational waves, they're not large compared to the wavelength. You can't make pictures. So instead, you learn about the sources through the two waveforms and doing modeling of sources and comparing the waveforms you see with those that are predicted by good models, such as numerical relativity simulations. So it's a very different kind of astronomy to be done gravitationally than electromagnetically. There are four frequency bands in which we, expect, which we expect to be opened for gravitational wave detection in the next roughly one decade. The high frequency band between about 10 hertz and 10 kilohertz, in which the LIGO and Virgo and Einstein uh, ground-based laser interferometer gravity wave detectors operate. Here we are. Uh, I, my guess is with their, we're within about two years of seeing the waves. We will see them sometime between this year and 2019 is my expectation. There is the low frequency band between 10 to the minus 5 and 10 to the minus 1 hertz in which LISA, or it's now called ELISA, and the so-called Big Bang Observatory would operate. Uh, LISA should have uh, been launched sometime in the middle part of this decade. And for political reasons and fear that uh, they wanted to do a, a test of the technology in space first, and that test is uh, now will, will fly this year, uh, there is a delay. The rational am amount of delay would be a few years, maybe five years after the test flight. But in fact, for political reasons, it's currently slated to launch in 2034. That's Funding reasons. It's a question of it getting into, into a queue. So, it's, so first of all, NASA dropped out of LISA because NASA had big cost overruns on the James Webb Space Telescope. They had to kill a lot of things. LISA was among the things that got killed to deal with that. So it's now an all European mission. And in Europe, it is uh, currently slated to launch in 2034. It's an all European mission. Now there's hope in the community that this can be speeded up. Maybe you can get NASA back in the game, that it might be a whole new ball game after the test flight of what is called the Pathfinder mission, uh, which will be this year. 
uh, but we will see. If, if that test flight goes extremely well, uh, then there could be a very big push to bring Lisa, uh, uh, to launch Lisa long before 2034. But an awful lot is riding on the, this Pathfinder mission. Yes. Yeah. Uh, there is a there is a a planned configuration which is has one million uh, light kilometer long arms, which is uh, five four times shorter than the original yeah, Lisa. So it's not it, that's right. Well, well, there are three satellites, but yeah, but but but, but all, in the current version, just links between a corner satellite and NSAT. So it's it's. The, the design has been cut way, way back in order to bring it into a cost level that Europe, that uh, ESA is, ready, is willing to consider uh, doing alone without, without NASA. But um, it can change. It can change. change. Everything, everything can change. I think, as I say, a, a huge amount is riding on how the test flight goes this year. <coughs> Pulsar timing arrays uh, in which you're uh, looking for, uh, for, uh, for coherent oscillations in the timing of pulsars at different locations on the sky caused by a gravitational wave flow, uh, uh, moving across the Earth and affecting the clock, ticking rates of all clocks on Earth. Uh, that is a technique that operates in the range between 10 to the minus 9 and 10 to the minus 7 seconds and is likely also to have success in the next several years. So in, in some sense, there's a rush, a competition between the interferometers and the pulsar timing to see which will get there first, but they are separated in uh, frequency by more than difference between the radio band and the optical band, and so they see very different things. So it's very complementary science. Pardon? For, for the pulsar timing array, it's primarily, it's basically binary black hole systems. Uh, stochastic background of binary black holes with a few individual binary black holes that uh, stick up as individual sources. Supermassive. Supermassive, yes. But, so, I, I mean, it's, uh, I mean, th these are distance, distance, cosmological distances, basically. I forget what the numbers are. Do you know, Ram? Uh, yeah, I forget. Um, okay, and then, there's the cosmic microwave background anisotropy, which has been very much in the news this year with the detection of the so-called B modes of the anisotropy, uh, B modes of the polarization, the, uh, uh, which should be produced indirectly by primordial gravitational waves. And then the controversy <laughs> and the attempt to clarify whether those B modes that were detected uh, by uh, the BICEP2 uh, detector whether they're really produced by something very much more mundane, uh, scattering of E modes off of dust. Um, and uh, that whole story is not yet settled, but uh, it's a very exciting and very active area now. Yeah. I think it's settled. Okay. Or it will be settled within two weeks. Okay. okay. Well, I've been, wait I've been waiting for. <laughs> yeah. No, just people will yeah. Us. Yeah. That yeah. They cannot claim any detection. Yeah. Oh, oh they, yeah, they, yeah, so it, it's clear that, the, that dust could very well be responsible. The, the question is, how well can you pin down the amount of dust in the direction that uh, BICEP is looking? Yeah. Yeah. So, so we, we will see. We, I mean, we've been waiting for, for the new Planck results that were supposed to be out in October. But, yeah, yeah. Uh, so, 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 so are, are, the, are the coordinated uh, BICEP and Planck uh, data out? I mean, they're doing a joint data analysis. I haven't seen that. Okay, okay. Okay, okay. okay. Well, all I know, uh, since, since I live in Hollywood these days, and <laughs> All I know is what I read on GRQC, and it's not there yet. <laughs> yes? I misunderstood. I thought that the gravitational waves only affected distances. Only, so uh, they affect, 
so the stretching and squeezing affects distances. The twisting affects uh, dragging inertial frames. And uh, then if you look at something that's as non-local as a gravity wave detector that involves a, uh, a source that, that involves one end of the detector is on Earth and the other is a pulsar very far away, so that the uh, length of the, uh, the distance between the two ends is long compared to the wavelength. Then you're not just looking at the Riemann tensor. You're looking at uh, some integrals of the Riemann tensor. And it turns out that you basically get oscillations in rate of flow of time, in effect, or of index of refraction is another way to say it. So I, I'm going to focus in the remaining time uh, on the ground-based gravity wave detectors. I've given you some sense that there are these other techniques that, uh, th that both the CMB uh, polarization, looking for gravitational waves from the Big Bang, primordial waves, and the pulsar timing, looking for waves from massive black hole binaries, they both are all likely to have near future de uh, reliable detections. Uh, but, uh, and LISA is delayed, and in the last 10 minutes, I will talk about then the low frequency uh, detect detections, or uh, searches for gravitational waves. So, uh, whenever we've had a radical new window under the universe, we've seen some great surprises. And gravitational waves are far more radically different than anything we've ever seen before than our radio waves or x-rays. And so that's, uh, they're a completely new form of radiation. There's a frequency band that we're dealing with that spans 22 get decades from the high frequency to the extremely low frequency. So there's a huge amount of, uh, of band for exploring the universe in with a completely new kind of radiation. And uh, so there are very, very likely to be surprises. We will explore what I like to call the warped side of the universe, phenomena that are made from warped space-time, such as colliding black holes. We'll study the nonlinear dynamics of curved space-time, such as I was talking about with vortexes and tendexes. We'll be able to answer astrophysical and cosmological puzzles, such as how are supernovae powered and how are gamma ray bursts powered questions like that. So there's a lot of rich science that we expect to get out, but the most exciting is the surprises, I, I do believe. For ground-based gravity wave detectors between 1 or 10 and 10,000 hertz, the technique that is used is laser, laser interferometry, as most of you are aware. You hang mirrors from overhead supports, <coughs> separations between these mirrors, uh, typical 4 kilometers. Gravitational wave tendex lines push these apart while well, they push those together at frequencies high compared to the one hertz uh, swinging frequency. So they behave like uh, free masses. Uh, at the next half cycle, these are pushed together and those are pushed apart. Uh, the, uh, you use laser interferometry to monitor this. You wind up with an intensity going into a photodiode uh, that is proportional to the gravitational wave field. And for order of magnitude, with an h less than or of order of 10 to the minus 21, an arm length of 4 kilometers, you're looking for times changes of separation of test masses, of mirrors. These are 4 kilometers apart, the level of 4 times 10 to the minus 16 centimeters or less. Uh, it's, yeah, but, but this, this is the, the raw motion. So you use techniques to build up a signal. You use interferometry techniques to build up a signal. Uh, and uh, this level of sensitivity has been achieved and a little better than this has been achieved. And it is a real experimental accomplishment to think about monitoring motions of mirrors that now in the current, in advanced LIGO weigh uh, 40, kilom 40 kilograms, monitor these motions at a level that is about one one thousandth the diameter of the nucleus of an atom. Um, there's an international network of these detectors, LIGO detectors, Livingston, Louisiana, Hanford, Washington, uh, and Hanover, Germany, basically a developmental uh, facility uh, built by the, uh, by the, Brit the British and Germans. Uh, there's the Virgo detector that's a now, now a French-Italian-Dutch collaboration in Pisa, Italy. There is a LIGO detector that will be built in India uh, and the Japanese uh, collaboration 
is building a detector called Kagra uh, underground in Japan. So the things in green are things that are basically either operational now or will be operational in the, in the very near future, and yellow are going to come along in another five years or so. Um, LIGO, the Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory, is a collaboration of 850 scientists at 75 institutions in 13 nations, primarily the US, UK, and Germany, and India now coming to be a very major player. Two facilities in Livingston, Louisiana, and Hanford, Washington, and the interferometer planned for India. Uh, LIGO timeline, 1971 to 1989, this spans my career, I should say. Uh, I uh, got my uh, PhD in 1965. I got into this business in 1971 as a theorist. And uh, uh, the R&D was done in 71 to 89 uh, by teams led by Ray Weiss at MIT and Ron Reaver at Glasgow and Caltech. 1989, uh, I as the theorist who tried to make peace between these warring experimenters. Uh, uh, and provided some vision for this. Uh, we pre presented our first proposal to build LIGO in 1989, uh, and we would do it in two stages. We would build initial detectors at a sensitivity where if we were very lucky, we would see waves, but we probably wouldn't. And then we would upgrade to advanced detectors, which would be at a sensitivity where we'd have a high probability of seeing waves from a number of sources. We had to do it in two steps because these advanced detectors, which we basically knew how to build at the time, they're so complex and so delicate that we didn't think we had a prayer of getting them to work unless we did it, uh, built the simpler detectors first and did it in this two-step uh, two two process. 95 to 2000, the team constructed uh, the LIGO facilities and installed the initial interferometers. Uh, in 2001 to 2005, they commissioned the initial interferometers. Uh, it took basically from 2001 to 2005 to reach design sensitivity. It was a long process. These are very complex instruments, but keep that in mind, about four years to reach design sensitivity when I show you what Advanced LIGO is doing. 2005 to 2007, in 2007 to 2009, there were gravitational wave searches with the initial interferometers. 2007 to 2010, we constructed the components for advanced interferometers, the second stage. 2010 to 2012, we installed the advanced interferometers. 2012 to 2015, uh, they were being commissioned. And they, uh, the first of the advanced interferometers achieved lock in, uh, in uh, May of 2014, and I'll show you where it is now. Uh, the first search with these advanced interferometers will be this year, and then a series of searches and improvements, searches and improvements over the coming few years. Um, what did I just lose? Uh, 2017 is my estimate of when we'll be nearing design sensitivity, but in fact, I'm going to show you something rather surprising about where the team now is. These are noise curves. This is the square root of the spectral density of the gravitational wave field in units of strain per root hertz. As a function of frequency ranging from 10 hertz up to 10,000 hertz noise curve. These spikes in there are things that you easily remove in the data analysis. They're due to various resonance, mechanical and optical resonances in the system. This was our design noise curve and the red and the green were what was achieved in initial LIGO, basically right on the money, except at the very lowest frequencies where there were some problems down here uh, matching the design. Uh, pardon? Um, uh, oh, Louisiana, Louisiana, Livingston, Louisiana, and Hanford, Washington. O over. Oh, 1 times 10 to the minus 24. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> uh, the, the, these are, the astronomers always have their own peculiar units. And so these astronomers are no different from any other astronomer. Okay. 10 to the minus 24 per root hertz. If you take uh, this 10 to the minus, it's 3 10 to the minus 23 
per root hertz. You ask about a gravity wave signal that's broad band, so it has a bandwidth equal to frequency. So multiply by the square root of 100 hertz, which is the frequency here, which is 10 root hertz. You get a dimensionless h of 310 to the minus 22. So 310 to the minus 22 was initial detector. Search 2005, 2007, got interesting limits, didn't see anything. There was a minor upgrade while we were waiting for the money for advanced LIGO and pushed down by about a factor of two uh, beyond the original design sensitivity for uh, the initial detectors. Search in 2009, uh, 2010 and didn't see anything as expected. This is where one of the two advanced detectors is today. It achieved first lock in May. This is where it was in mid-December. This is taken, a, a noise curve taken out of the log book, or the electronic log book, of, uh, and, and it was provided to me by David Wright. He was the director of LIGO. It's really impressive that in six months, they were able to, tur the, to turn on, lock the interferometer in six months they are down about a factor of three better than initial LIGO and within about a factor of three or four of their design sensitivity. The, yeah, well, there are lots of resonances in here, lots and lots of resonances. So there are resonances in the wires by which the mirrors hang. There are optical resonances uh, where you have light resonating in ways you don't, it had not to be resonating. Uh, th they can diagnose what they are. They're so, all so narrow, they're easily removed in the data analysis. Yeah, uh, yeah so yeah, if, if you had something broad like this, this is a problem that's got to be dealt with. That's right. Yeah, that's right. And so there are issues here. Remember, this is six months since lock. Yeah. And to get to that level with initial LIGO was several years from first lock. It's the, it's the result of really knowing what they're doing, having built their initial interferometers and uh, uh, having that experience. Okay, so I'm basically, I've been told that this is the end. Let's see. I don't think, yeah, I'll, I was just going to talk about some of the technology uh, for the upgrade to advanced LIGO, right. but I won't do that. Okay, so let's go, go back to that. So it's a factor of, they say 10, it's, I think it's really 15 below the initial LIGO curve. So we're down a factor of three, they expect another factor of three or four, five. So it's down in here. Yeah, but in terms of RMS, multiply by the square root of the bandwidth, of, of the frequency. This is noise of 1 times 10 to the minus 22. For a broadband signal to really believe what you see is the real thing, you need a signal noise ratio of something like 8. And so uh, this is really currently operating at a level where you could with high confidence detect a signal at uh, say uh, 8 or 5, five 8 times 10 to the minus 22, something like that, depending on how much signal noise ratio you really need. And so they're aiming, expecting to go down another factor of uh, three to five, something like that. I mean, there's a precise noise curve that I've not shown you here that is later in this talk, but I've been told I'm finished.